So if you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, we are um, in the last and final week of our series called The Grudge, uh, our love series for February. Uh, and we've talked about some heavy and not so heavy topics. I, I hope um, that you, you have gotten some clarity, maybe some freedom that you didn't have before. I know, uh, I knew they were going to do that. Before I get started, let's go ahead and dismiss the kids. By the way, guys, if I ever forget, as soon as the music's over, the kids can go out. I'm going to forget. I even had them put, look, everybody turn around. I even had them put a reminder up there, and I still forgot it. I was too busy tripping down the steps. That's what it was. Uh, back to my regularly scheduled program. Um, you know, when I prepare a sermon series, when, when I listen to what God has to say, when I kind of research this, sometimes these things just hit me hard. And this series has really kind of done that to me. So I hope for you it's done that too. We've talked about some, some, some interesting things. We talked about first how to forgive the day-to-day -day grudges that build up, right? That, that's, that most, for the most part, these little small things are in no way uh, even important enough to, to bog us down. We just kind of got to get over that. And then we talked about the really heavy subject of forgiving the big offenses in our lives. Those things that have cut us deeply, that have hurt us, that we've carried for years and years and years. And we learned that forgiveness is not ever designed to stop with us. It is supposed to flow to us and through us out to the world. And last week we talked not about forgiving God because God doesn't sin, God doesn't ever do wrong. There's no reason for us to forgive him, but we do get to that point when he hasn't done the things we think or hasn't shown up the way he would that, that um, we carry these grudges against him. And we learned how to get past that last week. And, and we realized that it, just because we're in a waiting season does not mean we're in a wasted season. God works in his own time. And we learned that he is always good. And that through all those seasons, whether we're waiting or whether we're, we're getting his miracle or whether we're getting his blessing or whether we don't see him working or not, that we, we should get up and worship him once more, not because of what he does for us, but because he is good. God is good all the time. And this week we're going to talk about forgiving the person that I think is the hardest of all to forgive. This week we're going to talk about forgiving ourselves. And, and, and that's, you know, kind of a, a hard thing to do because uh, how do we forgive ourselves when, when we've let ourselves down? When we, we maybe did something we knew was wrong or, or made a choice, you know, or, or, or didn't make a choice or whatever it was. How do, how do we forgive ourselves when we've let God down? And that's a big one. When, when we've kind of just walked away or or. or we know God wouldn't approve of this, but we do it anyway. How do we forgive ourselves when we've let other people down, or we've hurt someone, or even if it wasn't our intention to hurt someone, that's the way it ended up. How do we forgive ourselves? And that's difficult, because <laughs> we know what we did. We know that thing that's hiding inside. We know the hurt we caused. We know the words we said. And that causes us to just go to this place where if we're not careful, we can become deeply ashamed, riddled with guilt. We get to the point where we, we can't let it go. How can we forgive ourselves when we get to that point? How can we forgive ourselves when we have lived with this thing, whatever it is, you name yours? How can we forgive ourselves when we've got that? I don't know what yours is, but, but for me, mine actually kind of built up and built up over uh, many years, probably 20 years uh, in total. You guys probably know, so some of you don't, but I was, I was raised in the Catholic Church, and, and around the time I was 12, my mother... Uh, went to what we would call now a Bible study. They called it prayer group, but Bible study. And that's where, you know, she learned the gospel. You, you know, believe in Jesus, put your faith in him, ask him to be the Lord of your life, and that is where salvation leads. And I wanted part of that. At 12 years old, I understood that. I understood what it was to be forgiven of your condition of sin and to be forgiven of the sins you have committed. And I wanted it, so I asked Jesus into my heart, too. At 12 years old, 12 years old now, 
<laughs> of course, the problem is at 12 years old, there's not a whole lot of sin to forgive, right? I mean, there aren't that many really terrible 12-year-olds. I've known a few. Um, one of them was my son, but that's a different story. Uh, you know, but, but I didn't, you know, well, what I do? I, I back talk to my parents. Stole my brother's candy out of his Easter basket. I mean, those were the sins that you're forgiven of when you're 12 years old. You know, not, not much at all. But, but then, later in life, when I hit 18, 19, 20, there was a whole world out there. And I did some horrible, awful things. For many years, I partied too much. I drank too much. I had relationships I know I shouldn't have had. I was not the 12-year-old kid asking Jesus to come into my heart. And that went on for a long, long time. A long time. And then, you know, the thing about Catholic Church is it's all about guilt, right? You're supposed to feel guilty. And then you're supposed to go do penance. But then I started going to Protestant churches, churches outside the Catholic faith, and they were talking about this love of Jesus and this it once forgiven, always forgiven. And, and he took it all to the cross. And while I knew that in the back of my head, it really never clicked. Until I got there, and so here I am in these new church situations, and they're just a different kind of people altogether. And I'm guilty because I spent all those years just running away from Jesus, and then I feel guilty because I didn't realize that he was forgiving me. And, I, you know, I don't know. I had something wrong with me. You know, I'm like, Jesus, you might have forgiven me, but I don't think I can forgive myself for all those years. I can't get past that. And I don't know what it is for you guys. We all have something. Maybe when you were younger, you were in this period of your life where you were just drinking all the time. And it became something that controlled your life, and you, and you made some decisions, and there were things that you just can't undo. M maybe when you were young, or maybe not so young, you found yourself in some desperate situation. And, and while you made a choice that you thought was the best thing for your self-preservation, you know that it wasn't the right choice, and somebody got hurt. How do you get past that? Maybe you have all the good intentions in the world and, and, and you're a dad like I was at some point and, and you said, I'm going to provide for my family. I'm going to make sure that my family is taken care of. They're always going to have a roof over their head. They're always going to have food on the table. They're not going to want for anything. I'm going to get me a job and I'm going to work at it. And you start working eight hours a day and 10 hours a day and 12 hours a day and 14 hours a day. And you do everything you set out to do and your kids have the best life ever. But what they don't have is a relationship with you. Maybe you found yourself in an odd spot in your relationship or your marriage. And rather than leaning in, you leaned out. And you betrayed that trust and that love. Maybe it's 2 o'clock in the morning in a dark room in front of your computer. And you start clicking. And you love God and you love your wife and you know it's wrong, but you just can't help yourself. How do you get past that? What do you do when the guilt haunts you? When the guilt just won't go away? We get to this point and we ask this question, why can't I forgive myself? That's what we're talking about today. Why can't I forgive myself? And how do I deal with this guilt? And before we really get into it, I want to acknowledge something that I think is very important. And that is this. Not all guilt is created equal. It's true. Not all guilt is created equal. There is something we would call false guilt. And false guilt is when you're carrying around something that you shouldn't be carrying around. Something wasn't your fault. You didn't really have any control over it, and yet you feel guilty about it. And, and, you know, maybe your parents were divorced when you were a kid. And like many kids do, they get themselves into this kind of mind game where you say, well, if I had just been a better child, if I had just said I love you to my parents a little more often, if I had just got daddy's slippers for him when he came in, if I had just, if I had just, if I had just gotten better grades, maybe my parents wouldn't have gotten divorced. And you carried that guilt with you. Or maybe the unthinkable is you were, you know, somewhere in your childhood abused. And, you know, as is all too common and as awful as abuse is, a lot of times the person who is abused is made to feel like it's their fault. Like they did something to cause that. 
There's any number of things that can cause us false guilt, but I want to tell you that this false guilt, that, that this is not your fault. Those kinds of things are not your fault. There is no reason to be guilty about it. Don't buy in to the devil's game of, of shaming you into a false guilt over something you had absolutely no control over. I suffered from this myself for a while. My, my very best friend growing up, his name was Joe. That's actually not made up. It's not like a name changed to protect the innocent. His name actually was Joe. Uh, we were thick as thieves. You guys remember me telling you the whole one pump story about, you know, running around and shooting each other with BB guns? Well, it was me and Joe. That's who it was. I mean, we were the guys. If I was somewhere, he was there. We went to high school together, grade school together, homecomings, proms, you name it, we did it. We were thick as thieves our whole lives growing up. We got married, we were still friends. We had kids, we were still friends. And then he got divorced, I got divorced. And our paths kind of went like this. I, I, I kind of embraced the adulting lifestyle. I kind of embraced the being responsible with my kids and my family and making sure that they were taken care of. And he, I found out from his father, who actually lives right around the corner from me now, from his father that he can't even see his kids because he can't pass a drug test. And, 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 and that relationship just kind of went, and, and I haven't spoken to him in... Well, my oldest daughter's 29 years old this year. And so it's been about 25 years. I haven't spoken to him. And I carried that guilt around with me because I'm like, is there something I could have done? That could, is this my, my fault? Could I have reached out to him? But, but the fact is, is that he made a choice. And, and I knew for me, I couldn't be in that environment because I knew what it would do for me. That's false guilt. False guilt, it's always bad, it's always destructive, and it's always dangerous if we hold on to it. I just want to make that distinction, that there are things that happen to you you do not need to carry around. But there's another kind of guilt. And as strange as it may sound, there is a kind of guilt that you can consider a gift. There is a kind of guilt that if it truly brings us to a place of of sorrow and, 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 and I'm sorry for this and knowing what we did wrong, if we embrace that, then that kind of guilt can draw us closer to God if we let it. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 10, he says, Godly sorrow, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is this, this feeling of conviction where, where I know what I did was wrong and I am so sorry. Help me. Help me get past this. Help me just, just kind of give it to you. Help me, God, I, I love you so much and I didn't mean to do this. Godly sorrow can point us to God. It can lead us to his grace. It can, it can help us to claim the forgiveness that he's already given us. It's helpful. Godly sorrow. It's a good thing. But Paul contrasts that with worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow always takes us down the wrong path. Worldly sorrow is never beneficial. Worldly sorrow destroys us and it hurts us. And it never points us in the right direction. Worldly sorrow Godly sorrow can change our behavior. If we embrace it, if, we, if we're truly sorry, if we apologize, if we, we try to heal those things that we hurt, we can find freedom from the guilt. Maybe you can relate with a gentleman in Scripture uh, named Peter. I think we all know who Peter is. Peter was kind of Jesus' right-hand guy when Jesus was walking around. Bullheaded guy. Peter spoke what he wanted to speak. Didn't think before he opened his mouth, kind of like me sometimes. But he was really a good guy. And, and he had a lot of good qualities. But, but, but the sad thing about Peter <laughs> is he had these moments of stupid on steroids. He really did some dumb stuff. I mean, one day he's there with Jesus. That, you know, they're, they're, they're in the upper room. He's, he's doing the right thing. He's honoring God. He, he, he's moving in the right direction, and then, and then we read a little bit, we'll get into that, that, that he just pulls out this thing that's dumber than dumb. <laughs> Peter and me, because I do that too, right? I want to do the right thing, but I do the dumb thing. The dumber than dumb thing, I do that. And we read this story where 
where Jesus is talking to him at the Last Supper. And Peter's there. He's like, Jesus, you know I'm your man, right? You know I got your back. You know no matter what, if somebody's coming at you, they're going to have to go through me first. I will never leave you. I always got you. You know, he's like fist bumping. He's like bro hug. He's like, yeah, Jesus, I'm your guy. And then Jesus turns to him and he says, well, you know, Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. Three times. I can imagine Peter's like, <laughs> no way. Not going to happen. Not going to do it. I don't know what you're talking about. But then Jesus got arrested and put on trial. And Peter's hanging out in the courtyard. And this little girl looks at him and says, hey, weren't you with that Jesus fellow? And Peter's like, new phone, who this? I don't know what you're talking about. Nope, I wasn't there. And then once more, another girl, a woman comes up to him and says, I know you, you were with him. And he says, no, I wasn't there. I was at a friend's house. Believe me, I got an alibi. I wasn't even there. And then we read this. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, verses 59 and 60, it says, about an hour later, about an hour later, another, another asserted, another asked, certainly this fellow was with him. Certainly, Peter, you were with Jesus because you're a Galilean. And some versions say, I can tell by the way you talk. Your accent gives you away. I know you were with him. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Can you imagine what Peter felt in that moment? Having just swore to Jesus that no matter what happens, I got your back. I got you, Jesus. And then the rooster crowed. And, and I want to point out a part of this story that Maybe we never really look at, uh, because a lot of times we stop right there at the rooster crowing, and we say that's the end of the story. But in verse 61, it says this, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him, before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And in the next line, John wrote, Peter wept bitterly. Peter wept bitterly because he had a godly sorrow. He knew. He knew what he did. Not only did he know what he did, but Jesus looked him right in the eyes when he did it. I can imagine he's sitting there saying, I can't believe how stupid I am. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to stand up for him. I wanted to take up for him. I wanted to stand in front of him while they were swinging those whips at him. I wanted to do that, but I didn't. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said those things. I can't believe I did it not once, not twice, but three times. I can't believe I didn't do the right thing. I'm never going to get past this. I feel so awful. I feel so guilty. I feel so ashamed. And it's at this point, when we allow our guilt to turn to shame, it's at that point that the enemy, the devil, has us exactly where he wants us. Because shame is the devil's playground. Shame is where he wants us. Shame is the device he uses to separate us from God. I, I want to tell you this, that, 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 that there is a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt says, I did something bad. That's all. I did something bad. I'm sorry for it. I feel guilty. But shame says, I am something bad. And there's a big difference between I did something bad and I am something bad. The devil uses shame to connect your actions to your identity. He says, yeah, you did it, but that's who you are. You'll never be any better than that. Hey, this, this forgiveness stuff Jesus is talking about, heh, good, fat chance. This is who you are, person. Remember that stuff you did? Yeah, yeah. 
He wants you to feel that you're pathetic. He wants you to believe that you're worthless. He wants you to believe that, that you're a failure and that you're hopeless and that God will never, ever bless you because of what you did. You're never going to be happy. You're never going to have a happy marriage. You're never going to provide for your kids the way you really want. You're never, you're never going to make a difference in this world. You're never going to find that freedom Jesus promised you. This pain you're feeling, the devil says that's punishment for your past. Shame. I can imagine that's what the devil was saying to Peter. You blew it, Peter. You blew it. You had the chance, but you blew it. Now everybody's going to know, all Jesus guys, all the disciples, they're going to know, the whole town of Galilee is going to know, Jesus knows, he watched you, he watched you. He looked straight in your eye while you denied him. You betrayed him. Your life is over. This is truth here, folks. The devil wants to use your shame to drive you away from God. It's the truth. That's where he plays all day long. But, but listen to this. Listen, God wants to use your guilt to draw you to his grace. Amen? That's exciting. God wants to use your guilt to draw you to his grace, to draw you to his forgiveness, to, to bring you into his fold, into his family, to defeat the devil. This whole difference between shame and guilt is kind of the, like the difference between uh, Peter and Judas. If you guys don't know who Judas was, Judas is another one of Jesus' disciples. And if we're right down, you know, really honest about it, what Peter did and what Judas did aren't that much different. Peter betrayed Jesus three times right in front of him. Judas betrayed him once for 30 pieces of silver, walked into the garden, kissed him on the cheek so the Roman soldiers knew who it was. But the difference is, if we read the ends of those stories, is that Judas had a worldly sorrow. He got caught. Everybody knew what he did. It was hard to hide. He walked up to him in the garden and kissed him on the cheek. He was probably embarrassed. And he got to that point of shame. And the devil just took that shame and started turning the screws and turning the screws. And, and Judas just, just couldn't get over this worldly sorrow. And the end of the story says that Judas took his own life. But Peter had godly sorrow. God, I know what I did was wrong. Jesus, will you forgive me? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is the kind of sorrow that leads us to God's grace, that leads us to repentance, to, to acknowledge our sin, to say, this is what I did. I know I did those things, but that's not who I am. That is not who I am. Godly sorrow leads us to a place of repentance. What is that? What is repentance? We talk about that word. It's kind of one of those churchy words, but it's really not that difficult to understand. Re- Turn, go in the other direction. Re, turn. And pent is from the same word that we get penthouse from. Higher. Turn from where you are and move to something higher. Godly sorrow always leads us to that place of repentance. Jesus went on to give his life for us. He was nailed to the cross. He for a moment became all the sin of the world. Every bad thing we've ever done, every piece of guilt we ever have, in future, forever, everything, he took it. He became it. And he nailed it to the cross. And three days later, after he was buried in that tomb, the stone rolled away. And he was victorious. All that stuff that he took up there with him, all the guilt and all the shame, he took it with him and he was victorious. He's already given you everything you need. All the forgiveness is already done, folks. Already done. He is victorious over your guilt, over your shame, if you allow him to be. If you allow him to be. We read in John's Gospel in the 21st chapter, you don't have to turn there, but it's kind of the end of this story with Peter. 
Peter's out fishing and he sees somebody on the shore and he doesn't really know who it is. And he soon enough realizes it's Jesus, but Jesus turns to Peter. And it's one of the most beautiful stories in Scripture, I think. Jesus turns to Peter after what Peter did. After Jesus looked him in the eye. And he said, Peter, do you love me? And I can imagine, it's not written in Scripture, but I can imagine Jesus just taking his hands on the side of Peter's face and looking him in the eye and saying, Peter, do you love me? And what's missing from this story is Jesus didn't say, uh, Peter, <laughs> you done messed up, Aaron. I mean, you need to go, right? You need to just kind of wallow in your self-pity. You need to just go and take a spiritual time out. You're never going to be used. I can't do anything with you, Peter. Go away. He didn't say that. What he said was, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. In other words, do my will, Peter. Go out and be my guy. Do you love me? Now, Peter could have responded different, too, because Peter did say, I love you, Lord. You know I do. Three times. I don't think that's a coincidence. Three times Jesus asked, do you love me? And three times Peter said, I love you. Now, he could have said, I'm sorry, Jesus. I can't take your forgiveness. No, I am scarred forever. That thing I did back there, it's now who I am. I, I, am, I am forever shamed. I'm going to wear this cloak over my face. Smear ashes all over me. That's what they did back then. But he didn't say that. He could have said, sorry, Jesus, your grace is not enough for me. But he didn't say that. He said, yes. I love you. I will accept your forgiveness. He acknowledged his sin. He repented. He turned. And he received Jesus' forgiveness. And it's no different than us. We just have to let it go. Jesus has already done the work. We have to let it go. I'm not going to sing like a Disney princess. Don't worry. But we have to let it go. Jesus already paid the price for all the stuff that you're holding on to, all the guilt. And instead of letting it turn to shame, which is what the devil wants, we can let it go. We can give it to him. We can say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that I don't have to live with this anymore. Jesus is going to make it all right. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, he said, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. We are going to be made new with the forgiveness of Jesus. That's what he said. John wrote later, John wrote later, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. Not just some of it. Not just the things that you want out in the public. The stuff that you're hiding back there, he's not going to let go. He's not, going to, he's not going to take care of that. All of it. All of it. We have to let it go. We have to, have to let go of you know, all these things that swim around in our head. The, the, the lust and the lies. And we have to let go of the deceit and the cheating and the neglect and the bad decisions and the, and the overworkaholic father syndrome and all that kind of stuff. We have to let it go because, because, because we can't change our past. We will never change our past by being trapped in this guilt and shame. But I want to tell you that God can change your future. God can change your future. Maybe you've been in that point where you betrayed that trust. But God can change your future. You now have the chance to be faithful. Maybe, maybe you suffered, you struggled with you know, addiction for many years, but God has, has, has already forgiven that. There's no reason to live in that shame. Now you can live a clean life. Maybe you let God down. Maybe you let yourself down. Maybe you let somebody else down. But, but now it's time to just claim his forgiveness. Let it go. Maybe you did something last night. And you're sitting in here today and saying, I can't believe I'm here after what I did. He's covered that too. Let it go. 
Let go of all the guilt. Let go of all the shame. Claim the grace and the forgiveness that Jesus gave us. He paid the price. But I will warn you that when you get to this place of claiming the forgiveness and letting go of the past and letting go of the shame and letting go of the guilt, the enemy, the devil, He's sly. He is going to try to bring it up. He is going to always try to remind you of what you did and, and who you hurt and, and, and your past. And he's going to try to, you know, uh, remind you of how awful you are and how ashamed you should feel. And he does this. He brings up our past and he reminds us of it because he's intimidated by our future. He's intimidated by the future we have through the power of Jesus Christ's forgiveness in our lives. This is the reason he came, so that the guilt and the shame doesn't have to keep us separated from God. He wants you to be a better, stronger, guilt-free version of you. Peter, our friend Peter, got chosen to be the primary speaker on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit descended down, he was the guy who went out there and he gave this sermon, and it wasn't a beautiful, fancy sermon. He basically said, repent of your sins and be saved. You know what happened? Because of Peter, Peter who denied Jesus three times, Peter who could have gone the same way as Judas, Peter, spoke those words, and Scripture tells us that thousands of people believed in Jesus Christ. From Peter. God didn't choose Peter because he was faithful. God chose Peter because he was forgiven. The same reason he chooses me, the same reason he chooses you, the same reason he chooses everybody who calls on his name. Not because we're faithful, because he knows that we're going to have these places where we always fall down. But he says, you don't have to make your guilt be the thing that is your identity anymore. You don't have to be ashamed of it. You are forgiven. Let it go. The devil wants to use your past to steal your hope for a better future. But Jesus says, you have a new future. A future of freedom. This is what I did. It's not who I am. I am a child of God. I am forgiven. I am covered by the blood. I am covered by the grace. I am covered by Jesus' work on the cross. Let it go. Maybe you had a bad chapter in your life. Maybe you had a bad, you know, series of chapters in your life. Maybe you had a whole bad book. But you know what, folks? Your story isn't finished yet. Jesus is making it new every day. Let it go. Forgiveness doesn't change your past. But here's what it does. It frees you for a better future. And there is this freedom when we claim this forgiveness. There is this freedom that just permeates our soul deep down. And we claim the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And we're able to let go of the guilt and the shame and all of those things that hold us back. All the baggage that we bring into this relationship with us. All of that stuff. There is freedom for that. Deep in your soul. When we get to this point where we say, yeah, I know who I was. But I am not that person now. There's a comfort. There's a... There's a a joy. There's a lingering hope. And maybe you're here today and you want to know how you can claim that forgiveness. 
Maybe you're here today and you're in that spot right there where Peter could have so easily been, where Judas was, where we all get to if we're not careful. That, that the shame of the things you've done, the devil is now using your actions to, to, to define your identity. He's saying, that's who you are. You'll never be any better. Maybe you're there right now and you don't know Jesus. And you, don't, you haven't claimed that forgiveness. You haven't claimed his power. You haven't taken advantage of the grace that's given to us. Because I want to tell you, folks, you can never undo and, and, and live good enough to, to, to get over that stuff. If you haven't claimed that forgiveness, I've got to ask you while you're waiting. And maybe you think, you know, well, I, I'm good. I, I, I come to church. I, 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 I know who Jesus is. I, I've read some stuff in the Bible. I, I've, do, I've done the things that would check the boxes, but you've never actually said, Jesus, I want you to take my life over. I want to claim your forgiveness. I believe that you are the Son of God. Make me new. Because that's the only way we can claim that forgiveness. We have to invite him into our life. We have to invite him into our heart. We have to invite him into everything that we have so that, so that the guilt and the shame doesn't any longer haunt us. If you're there, why don't you do that today? And if you would like to pray that prayer, if you would like to talk to someone more, if you'd like to talk to me more, if you don't want to do it here, just text me. I'm, I'm here. I'm always here. If you want to pray today, we can pray. You can pray sitting in your seat. You can pray that prayer. Find the freedom. Let it permeate your soul. Just lift this up. Without that, we would just be riddled with guilt and shame. God, we all need that. I just want to ask today, with all the heads bowed, just, just keep your heads down. If you, if you have prayed that prayer today, 
to ask Jesus to just take it over, would you just raise your hand, put it right back down again? Maybe you want to just recommit your life. Maybe you just want to kind of walk closer with him. And if that's you today, just raise your hand, put it back down again. God, we thank you for all those decisions. You are so awesome. We're so grateful that you were here with us today, God, that you filled this place, that you left your mark on everyone here. We're thankful for your your word that you've handed down for all these centuries so that we can know you and know about you. And we're thankful for all those who are here today, God. And we ask that you keep them safe until we meet again next week. God, we pray all this in Jesus' name. And together, as a church, we say amen. Um, Go out and check out the 21 Days of Prayer online. It's also in the email. There's a link to it.